you. And without further ado, updates in molecular can- therapy for GI cancers with Hannah K. Sanoff, MD, MPH. Hannah K. Sanoff, MD, MPH, is a gastrointestinal medical oncologist and clinical researcher. Her primary academic focus is on improving the quality of cancer care delivery. She approaches this goal through health services research, through leading value and quality initiatives at the UNC Health System. She serves as the clinical medical director for outpatient cancer services at the North Carolina Cancer Hospital, working closely with hospital administration to improve quality of care we deliver from the patient and the provider perspective. Dr. Sanoff is also a clinical trialist and has served as the principal investigator on a number of industry cooperative and investigator-initiated clinical trials. Dr. Sanoff, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Tim. Uh, What's one thing we should know uh, about you outside of your professional bio there? Um, I guess probably the first thing that comes to mind is that I just love being outdoors and um, I find nature to be um, sort of a a wonderful um, outdoor church type of experience is where I where I sort of find myself most centered. Great. Thank you so much. And today's not a bad day for that. This uh, beautiful weather we're having here in North Carolina. A little rainy, but but awfully warm. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm showing my time that I, that I lived in Washington state uh, <laughs> where, where there you, 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 you had to just get a good raincoat and get out there. And uh, Fair enough. <laughs> all right. Um, this is our first poll everywhere question. Molecular therapy is personalized for each patient. So as to target their unique cancer growth abnormalities, a true B false. While you're thinking about that, I'll say that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC uh, Office of Continuing Professional Development. William A. Wood and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Greensboro Area Health Education Center is approved as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by North Carolina Nurses Association, an accredited approver of, by the American Nurses Credentialing Center Commission on Accreditation. In a case, Sanoff, MD, MPH has no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Whew. And here we go. Here's that first poll everywhere question. Um, we try to give you kind of a softball at the beginning. So uh, <laughs> uh, take a few more seconds if you haven't already had an opportunity to respond to that. Uh, how's it looking, Dr. Sanoff? It looks like people are, are all in for molecular therapy. All right. I'll turn it over to you. Updates in molecular therapy for GI cancer. All right. So um, I just want to start off by saying that this is going to be a little bit of an oddball talk and that there have been a lot of fun changes in GI cancer now that we have um, really some new drugs that have come out, um, some new drugs and some new targets in the past couple of years. And so I'm going to try and highlight a couple that have really been advances in the past year, year and a half, and ones that I think um, may be either confusing or things that people may not have seen. So um, it doesn't have necessarily a, uh, a continuous theme throughout, so I apologize for that, but I wanted to be sure everybody had seen some cool new data um, that has presented the next few years. So Tim, if you want to go ahead to the next slide. So, um, so here is our, our first question here um, that I wanted to see the answer and really looking which disease is immunotherapy, specifically immune checkpoint inhibitors, the standard of care in GI cancer. And our answers are A, metastatic colorectal cancer, B, esophageal cancer, C, metastatic pancreatic cancer, or D, all of the above. Um, so give folks a second to answer all of these. All right, well, it looks like we're having a little bit of shift. Um, And um, I think what we're gonna see over the course of the next couple of minutes is that the answer to this question is actually 
B, um, esophageal cancer. Um, I tried to throw you guys off with my all metastatic colorectal cancer, um, and, and that turns out not to be true, unfortunately. And we still have yet to crack the nut of metastatic pancreatic cancer for immunotherapy. So, um, so let's dive right in. Next slide. So these are what, ooh, whoops, you want to go back to those objectives for me, thanks. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to try and define when targeted therapies improve outcomes for patients with GI cancer, specifically highlighting why molecular testing is essential, uh, when immunotherapy is effective, so getting at that question we just asked, why tar what targeted therapies are now available for biliary tract cancers, and when HER2-directed therapies are a viable option. Next. So I made this slide uh, a while ago, um, really trying to sit back and think, you know, we send all of this just next generation sequencing and, and do IHC for things like PDL1 and mismatch repair deficiency. You know, when does this actually matter? How many of our patients are we helping with these? And, um, you know, what you can see here is that I have, you know, the, the, the test itself um, on the, in the rows and then the columns are different kinds of cancers. And the darker it is, the more, either the more likely the, the cancer is to harbor that mutation or the bigger the advantage. And what we see is, you know, there are a couple of scenarios in which we see some very dark blue where we both have a good chance and good benefit. Uh, but for the majority of cancers, um, we're still actually in a pretty light colored scenario there. Next slide. So let's start by talking about uh, gastroesophageal cancers, because we have had some major changes in what we do for this disease over the course of the past couple of years. And very specifically, we've had a lot of studies coming out that help us understand when we should be using immunotherapy, specifically immune checkpoint inhibitors in gastroesophageal cancer. And we also have some really exciting data about how we can go after that HER2 amplification in people who've progressed on first line. Next slide. So let's start out by talking about a case. And, and this is a fellow who I took care of a couple of years ago who was really very healthy when he came in for care, but it had about three months of dysphagia and a 15 pound weight loss. Um, as I mentioned, he was otherwise healthy and his exam was very unremarkable. His upper endoscopy showed a near obstructing mass down towards the bottom of his esophagus. And the biopsy of that came back showing a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Um, he had this PET scan, which showed a fairly long segment of an FDG avid mass in his distal esophagus, but thankfully no evidence for metastatic disease. Next slide. So the treatment for this fellow at that time, and also if he were to walk into my office today, remains to be a treatment without any targeted therapy. So folks who have any sort of involvement of the wall of the esophagus or any lymph nodes involved, regardless of whether they have squamous or adenocarcinomas of the esophagus, get upfront treatment with radiotherapy with which we give radiosensitizing chemo with carboplatin and paclitaxel. Um, if they have a clinical complete response, meaning the cancer goes completely away, we can no longer find it, they're a subgroup of people with squamous cell where we might consider non-operative management, but the majority of people go on to have an esophagectomy. Next slide. Um, and that is what happened with this fellow. He, he had his treatment and went on to have some residual disease on his PET scan. He went to esophagectomy and was found to have um, some residual moderate to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma in the surgical specimen. There was evidence that had responded, so he had treatment effect, but there was still um, wall involvement in one of 10 lymph nodes were involved. Next slide. So the reason I'm bringing this up to you all in this talk on molecular therapy is that we have a new standard now for these patients. And that is an, a year of adjuvant nivolumab for people who have resected uh, esophageal or gastroesophageal junction cancers with pathologic residual disease. Next slide. So that, um, that FDA approval for nivolumab in the adjuvant setting is based on this trial, um, which is called the Checkmate 577 trial. 
So this trial took anybody who, just like our gentleman we just talked about, had had upfront chemoradiotherapy and had residual disease at the time of surgery. A really important point here is that um, though we think PDL1 may be a biomarker for immunotherapy response, in this trial, patients were allowed to be enrolled whether or not their cancer harbored a PDL1 expression. And patients went on to get either a placebo or a year of adjuvant nivolumab. A couple of things to point out about the people who participated in this trial, if you want to go back for me, thanks, um, is that most of these people had esophageal, not gastroesophageal junction cancers, and most had adenocarcinomas. We also see 75% of patients actually did not have PDL1 expression in their cancer. Next slide. So these are the results from that trial, which are really pretty unequivocally positive. Um, uh, we are going to look at a ton of these survival curves, and so let me just take a minute to remind those of you who are not uh, comfortable with looking at these on, on an everyday basis. Um, in this figure, we have on the y-axis disease-free survival, which means the chance of being alive and cancer-free, and on the x-axis, we have the months in time. So what you can see is the people who were treated with nivolumab, which are shown in blue, pretty much starting at about nine, uh, six to nine months, started having an improved chance of being alive and cancer-free. And that really persisted out to the sort of 40-month period of follow-up that we have. And in fact, the median disease-free survival was actually doubled with this one year of adjuvant nivolumab. Next slide. Um, this is way too small for you guys to see, but a very important point is that the nivolumab effect was consistent across all sorts of subgroups of patients who enrolled in this trial. Next. And if you zoom in on this, what you can see is that um, where you have those little, uh, that forest plot with those dark uh, horizontal lines, if it is to the left of the line, it means nivolumab was better. And if it's to the right of the dotted line, it means placebo was better. And basically in the two key critical subgroups, um, to me, both the adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma patients benefited and patients both with and without pdl one expression in their cancer benefited from the adjuvant nivolumab. Next slide. So um, for what we do now for non-metastatic esophageal cancer, the summary is that there actually still is no role for molecular profiling per se, and that's because the nivolumab benefit appears independent of pdl one CPS score. And so to my mind, this is really one of the more important trials we've had in gastroesophageal cancer in many years, and nivolumab should now be offered to patients who have both squamous and adenocarcinomas that have residual disease after their upfront chemoradiotherapy and esophageal. Next slide. So um, I included this just for thoroughness sake to let you all know that unfortunately in non-metastatic stomach cancer, we actually haven't had any advances. Um, the plain old-fashioned perioperative chemotherapy remains the standard. There are some ongoing adjuvant trials of trastuzumab and pembrolizumab that will re be reported pretty soon, but right now we're just using pre regular old chemo, and my preference is for the three-drug chemotherapy combination of FLOT if somebody is healthy and able to tolerate that. Next slide. So let's move on to advanced metastatic gastroesophageal cancers. Next slide. So the same fellow that we've been talking about, who I should mention was treated prior to these nivolumab data, so he did not get any adjuvant nivolumab, uh, returned for his annual checkup. And while he was feeling well and actually had stabilized his weight and was swallowing with very little difficulty, his imaging showed that he had three new liver metastases, one of which is depicted there. Next slide. We sent off molecular profiling of his cancer, which showed that it was HER2 negative, but it was positive for PDL1 with a CPS score of 10. His cancer was also microsatellite stable. Next slide. So let's go back to this question of what is our first best treatment for this fellow for his recurrent esophageal cancer? Is it A, epirubicin cisplatin 5-FU or ECF? Is it B, full fox? Is it C, full fox with bevacizumab? Or is it D, full fox with nivolumab? So, uh, oh, we're changing as we go. Oh, oh, all right. So I think I 
I think I agree with the group. Um, I agree that it is D full Fox with, with nivolumab. Next slide. So let's talk about why that's the right answer. Um, so um, one of the reasons I thought this was an important topic to discuss is that the FDA approvals for nivolumab and pembrolizumab and gastroesophageal cancer have been incredibly confusing and hard to keep up with. Um, so this is my way to kind of try and summarize those data for you. Um, in nivolumab, which is shown on the left, really what we see is that it is FDA approved for first line with any chemo, with chemotherapy for any site, either stomach or esophagus, and any PDL1. Uh, it is also approved in second line for squamous cell. Pembrolizumab on the right is a little bit more complicated, and we're going to show the trial as to why that is. Uh, but it is positive. Uh, it is approved in esophageal cancers as well as in HER2 positive gastric and uh, gastroesophageal cancers. Um, next slide. So um, this is the trial that led, led the answer to that question to be full FOX uh, in nivolumab. And this is the trial on the basis of which the FDA approved nivolumab for all comers up front. So this trial, Checkmate 064, took gastric, gastroesophageal junction and esophagus, so the whole shebang, um, with adenocarcinomas and um, were allowed to have any pdl one status. So molecular testing here didn't matter, except they could not be HER2 negative because there's no trastuzumab in this trial. Um, and patients were randomized to get chemo with full FOX or chemotherapy with nivolumab. Next slide. So these are the key results. The trial was, was um, designed to have this pdl one high group be the primary endpoint. And what you can see here is that the patients who got chemotherapy with nivolumab, which are shown in blue, did better pretty much at, across the board than the people who got chemo only shown in gray. The absolute difference here is not gigantic. We see it's only about a 10% improvement in survival at a year and, and a fairly similar survival benefit at two years with a median overall survival benefit of three months. Next slide. If you start to dive into this a little bit more, because remember this included all patients regardless of pdl one CPS, you can see if you broaden that on the left-hand side to anybody who had uh, pd one positivity, the actual benefit of nivolumab starts to get a little bit smaller, so uh, a couple uh, percent less improvement across the board, but you do still see the same uh, almost three-month uh, survival benefit and about 10% survival improvement at, at a year. However, on the right-hand side, you can see if you include even the people who had pdl one negative disease, we do start to see a little bit of a decrease in the incremental benefit from nivolumab, still positive, but less so. Um, they haven't published this, they have shown this in abstract form. If you hone in on the pdl one negative people, really doesn't look like they're benefiting a whole lot. Next slide. So that was the, the first NEVO for everybody in first line. Um, what about pembrolizumab? So this is the trial that got pembrolizumab FDA approved for esophageal cancers. These are both adeno and squamous cell. And I just pulled out um, what actually turned out to be sort of a little bit of a mind-numbingly uh, difficult to follow set of uh, curves. But the moral of the story is if you cut and paste this across each different subgroup here, squamous cell carcinomas, adenocarcinomas, and high CPS, we see the same pattern, um, that patients with CPS positive disease um, have better uh, benefit from nivolumab, uh, but still across the board in that bottom D figure there, we see all patients had a benefit, and that's why this is FDA approved. The other thing I should say before we move on is if you look at that, that those two top um, figures, which are both squamous cell carcinomas, we definitely see that the benefit for squamous seems generally to be better than that of adenocarcinomas. Next slide. This is the trial, though, that in my opinion makes this whole situation somewhat confusing because this is very similar to the nivolumab trial that we started with and that patients got chemo with or without pembrolizumab, but it's important to mention uh, because it has a pembrolizumab-only arm. Next slide. So in this trial, even though it basically was the exact same trial as the one we started with, which was chemo with or without nivolumab, this was chemo with or without pembrolizumab. And even in the people on the left-hand side with a high 
uh, PDL1 CPS score, you actually uh, did not meet statistically significant benefits. So small incremental improvement by adding Pembro to chemo, uh, but it was not significant. And the same is clearly true on the right with the people with lower PDL1 expression. Next slide. But I mentioned this trial, even though Pembro was not approved based on this trial, because it, it did tell us something about the Pembrolizumab by itself group, because this is the only trial we have with that in first line. So if you see on the left-hand side, these are patients who had a high PDL1 score and got either Pembro to start or chemotherapy. There's no combination arm. And you can see the blue pembrolizumab patients at first do worse because a number of people have upfront progression on their pembro and more of them than in chemo. But yet you see more people who have a durable benefit from pembrolizumab. On the right, the MSI high subgroup, which is a very small number of people, right? You can see it's 14 plus 19, whatever that is. So it's a very few people, but in that small number of people, uh, the MSI high group seems to do great by getting pembrolizumab only. Next slide. Um, and so the final, um, final piece I'll share with you all, because I think it's really exciting and, um, here, is trials that just came out looking in HER2 positive gastroesophageal cancer. So this was a single arm trial um, just published in Lancet Oncology a few months ago. Uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. There are only 37 patients here. They had HER2 positive gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinomas. They could have any PDL1 status, but they had to be HER2 positive. And what you can see is in these patient, pa people who got chemo and trastuzumab and pembrolizumab, the response rate was 91%, which is really unheard of in gastroesophageal cancers. And the median overall survival was over two years. Um, again, unheard of in gastroesophageal cancer. Next slide. So this, this combination of uh, chemotherapy with 5-FU and a platinum and a trastuzumab and pembrolizumab is actually FDA approved now um, on the basis of this response rate at interim analysis. So this Keynote 811 trial is actually still ongoing. <clears throat> Excuse me, we don't have long-term survival data from it, but what we can see is that the people who get the whole combo, chemo, trastuzumab, and pembrolizumab, response rate is 74%. So 70, almost, almost three quarters of patients are having a meaningful reduction in the burden of their cancer, whereas it is much less. It's only half in people who are getting chemo and trastuzumab. Next slide. So um, as to the question of who should get nivolumab or pembrolizumab in first line, um, to me, the answer for that is anyone who is PDL1 positive. And the higher your PDL1, the more likely you are to get benefit. Nivolumab is approved for all sites in any PDL1, um, but Pembro is only for uh, esophageal junction cancers and esophageal cancers. The squamous cells appear to get more benefit than adenocarcinoma, so I push harder with that subgroup. And then the MSI high probably should get it, though we don't know the best sequencing. HER2 positive patients should also get it based on that data I just showed you out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think it is hard to know what to do about the low PDL1 patients or zero. So the zero to one group I struggle with. Nivolumab is technically FDA approved, but most patients are not going to get benefit and so run the risk of both financial and physical toxicity from getting nivolumab without clear benefit. The NCCN basically doesn't really uh, recommend it. Next slide. Okay, so you guys survived the immunotherapy whirlwind that is gastroesophageal cancer. So let's switch gears to uh, targeting HER2 after progression. So as most people on this call probably know, somewhere between um, 10 to 20 percent of people who have gastroesophageal uh, cancers have HER2 amplification or overexpression within their cancer. And for many years, uh, what we've done is given uh, chemotherapy with trastuzumab. But unlike in breast cancer, where you continue to do HER2-directed therapy after progression, in, in stomach cancers, that really hasn't worked. And we've had a number of second-line trials that have been negative, so including continuing trastuzumab, trying lapatinib, or trying TDM1. And so this phase two destiny trial here, the schema of which is on the right, is our first really exciting breakthrough in that field. 
Um, so this trial took people who had HER2 positive gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinomas and it already had progressed on chemo, including trastuzumab, and randomized to get trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is also called NHER2, or physician's choice of chemotherapy. Next slide. And so this was also a pretty unequivocally uh, positive trial, meaning trastuzumab deruxtecan was clearly superior to chemotherapy. So I summarized the response survival and progression-free survival data there in that table. And as you can see, response rate was 51% uh, compared to only 14% in chemo with trastuzumab deruxtecan with a four-month survival benefit and a two-month progression-free survival benefit. Next. And so in my mind, this is now the standard for progressing HER2-positive gastroesophageal cancer, and I typically use this in second line, not third line, given the excellent response rate. Next slide. So back to my heat map, I think... Um, you know, clearly the most important thing here is MSI because of the marked response to immunotherapy. pd one is important, although it is a little bit confusing to figure out what exactly we should do with it, and HER2 is critical. The rest of it, unfortunately, we don't really have anything we can do about. Next slide. Okay, so switching gears, let's talk about colorectal cancer. And so for colorectal cancer, we've actually been sequencing treatment by molecular profile since, gosh, when was RAS out? Probably about 2006. So it's been a long time, um, but we have gotten some new drugs and uh, are figuring out what to do with it a little bit better. So this CT scan is unfortunately from a, a patient I took care of who was a 47-year-old man who had presented with 30 pounds of weight loss and about four to six months of abdominal pain and increasing constipation. By the time he got into us, his bilirubin was already rising at 1.3, and his CEA was very high. As you can see, he had metastases all throughout his liver that were not surgically resectable, and he did have rectosigmoid thickening. His liver biopsy came back showing an adenocarcinoma consistent with colorectal primary. Next. So for colon cancer and rectal cancer, you know, this is our heat map. It's a little different in that that whole MAP kinase pathway of RAS, BRAF and HER2 are very important. And then the other critical one is MSI high. The others, not so much. Next. So, um, you know, ooh, I've got a little bit of a typo on this slide. So over there on the right-hand side where it's orange, it's supposed to say microsatellite high, not microsatellite stable. But really, when you're thinking about how to treat colorectal cancer, your first breakpoint is that question of, do they have a microsatellite high? Or said another way, the synonym is mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer. And if so, the answer is immunotherapy, and we're going to get to that in a second. If not, then what you're trying to do is figure out where they stand with their RAS um, and their BRAF mutation status. Now, we've had no major advances here in first-line therapy in the past, really, uh, five years or so. And so I'm not going to talk about that because that's sort of old news. But the answer is that these patients should get chemotherapy with bevacizumab unless they have a left-sided RAS wild-type, RAF wild-type cancer, in which the case they should get an EGFR inhibitor. Next slide. So our patient, uh, just to circle back with him, um, did have a KRAS mutation, which means that the only targeted therapy that was available to him is bevacizumab. Because of his extensive disease, he got triplet chemotherapy with full foxiri, which has the best likelihood of radiographic response, as well as bevacizumab. Next slide. So that was kind of old hat. That was what we've been doing for years. But what is new? So what's new is what we do for MSI high metastatic colorectal cancer. So this is a woman who I'm taking care of who is 38, and she presented with abdominal fullness. Her imaging showed a six centimeter right adnexal mass, which was presumed to be an ovarian primary. She has a personal history of AML as well as a right renal cell, despite being such a young woman. When she was taken to the operating room for a hysterectomy, she was actually found to have a right colon mass at XLAP, which turned out to be a moderate to poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma of the right colon involving both ovaries and multiple cirrhosal implants consistent with carcinomatosis. Her IHC showed loss of MSH2, and MSH2 is a mismatch repair deficiency enzyme, and if you have lost that, then your cancer is mismatch repair deficient, 
or said another way is um, MSI high. Unfortunately, this young woman, um, despite as soon as basically as soon as she got home, started having symptoms again and represented with increasing abdominal girth. Her imaging showed she already had a pretty uh, significant carcinomatosis and new ascites. Next slide. So for this lady with his mismatch repair deficient uh, colorectal cancer, what is our first best treatment for her? cancer at this time? Is it A, fulfoxirium bevacizumab? Is it B, encarafenib cetuximab? Is it C, pembrolizumab? Or is it D, 5-F uses patent and pembrolizumab? Ah, interesting. So we have a 100% fulfoxirium bevacizumab. Um, oh, a couple 5 few platinum pembros, a couple more, a couple pembro onlys. All right. Well, this is interesting. And I actually think that there, there are potentially a couple right choices here um, as to what the right answer is. Next slide. So the by the book answer to this question, if you're taking it for the boards, is the answer that she should get first line pembrolizumab. And that's based on this trial, which was presented two years ago at ASCO, a year and a half ago at ASCO, called Keynote 177. And this was patients just like our lady who had untreated metastatic colorectal cancer that was mismatch repair deficient um, and who were otherwise healthy. And they were randomized to get either pembrolizumab by itself or investigators' choice of basically like regular chemo. You could choose full FOX, full theory with an EGFR inhibitor if RAS wild type uh, or with bevacizumab. And patients who uh, progressed on chemo were allowed to go on to get pembro. Next slide. So these are the results of this trial. Again, another unequivocally positive trial. Here, this is the figure for progression-free survival, meaning the duration of time on treatment um, before your cancer progresses or you pass away. And as you can see here, um, the pembrolizumab in green initially actually starts out as a little bit inferior to chemotherapy with more people having progression sooner. But once you get to about three and a half to four months, you see that the pembro uh, patients start responding, and it turns out that over time, by the time you get to two years, there's a 48% chance of being alive uh, without cancer progression in the pembro arm and only 19% in the chemo arm. Next slide. So as to what is the optimal treatment for MSI high colorectal cancer in first line, the sort of by the book answer is, well, Pembro beats chemo, and so Pembro is the answer. But I am very concerned about the high rate of primary progressive disease with Pembrolizumab in that trial and wonder really if chemo should be included. It's also really not clear yet what the what the best role is for dual PD-1 inhibition with CTLA-4 inhibitors, which are also FDA approved. You know, if you look at that Keynote 177 trial, in that table there, I put the best response. And what you can see is um, almost 30% of people treated with pembrolizumab only had their cancer's best response of progression, whereas you have fewer people getting first-line progression with chemotherapy only. Um, so I actually, that brings me to, to sort of put in a plug for the Energy Swag Commit trial, which is ongoing, which will help us answer this question. So this trial is taking is the exact same patient population as that Keynote 177 we looked at, but patients are getting randomized to get a tezolizumab or to get full fox, bevacizumab, and a tezo. And so that will help us answer the question of whether long-term getting multi-agent uh, treatment is better than uh, immunotherapy only. Next slide. So for this lady, I actually kind of morphed <laughs> answer A of chemo and Bev with answer B of Pembro. And I gave her um, full Fox with Pembrolizumab because of my concern that her cancer was growing so rapidly. Uh, she initially went through the uh, process of dropping oxaliplatin when her neuropathy began. And then at six months, we dropped her 5-FU. And I am pleased to report that she's now um, over 18 months just on single agent Pembrolizumab without any radiographic evidence of disease. Next slide. So the other thing that's really important for everyone to know about is the role of BRAF V600E mutation targeting in metastatic colorectal cancer. Next slide. So um, 
as I showed on, actually, Tim, could you go back for me for one? So uh, in terms of first line, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we really have had no advances. And so in these patients, the first line answer is for folks who are really fit and want to be aggressive to give them full Fox theory with bevacizumab, or uh, if less so in concerns about toxicity of triplet to give them full Fox or full theory with bevacizumab. But our new advance is once they progress, what do we do next? All right, next slide, please. So that's where this beacon trial came in and has become the new standard for second line BRAF mutated cancers. So these were patients with metastatic colorectal cancer who, that harbored BRAF V600E mutation. And this is found in about 5% of people with metastatic colorectal cancer. These folks had all had at least one prior round of chemotherapy and were not allowed to have had a prior EGFR inhibitor. And they were randomized to get what was considered the standard of care, which is the orange box of arenotecan or fulfury with cetuximab, or this novel therapy of either encarafenib with cetuximab or encarafenib, binimetinib, and cetuximab together, the triplets. Next slide. So these are the data from the initial report uh, published in the New England Journal now uh, just a little over two years ago. And as you can see on the left, we have the um, triplet regimen and carafenib, binimetinib, cetuximab compared to just the regular old arenotec and cetux. Or on the right, we have the doublet of encarafenib, cetuximab versus arenotec and cetuximab. And as you can pretty clearly see, both of those novel agents in purple and blue are better than the green regular old treatments. Um, the difference in median survival is not gigantic. We only see, you know, about a three or so month improvement in survival, but it is still clearly better. Next slide. Importantly, though, uh, with longer follow-up time, we see that the, the doublet, the encarafenib in cetuximab, is just as effective as the triplet of encarafenib, binimetinib, and cetuximab. And so that figure there shows the updated survival curves with the chemo in the bottom on gray, but the two experimental arms of triplet or doublet therapy shown in blue and red really are like literally the exact same. They completely overlap in time. And so based on this, encarafenib and cetuximab were FDA approved um, as the new standard of care for BRAF V600E mutated cancers in second line. Um, I, it's actually approved for second or third or any line you want to give it, just not first. But given um, what I haven't talked about just for because of time, BRAF mutated cancers have a very poor prognosis. And while they actually do very similarly with first line chemo, where things tend to go off the rails for these patients is because they have very rapid progression in second and third line and often uh, don't respond. And so given that, I typically give this in second line and don't reserve it for third. And there is an ongoing trial of this encarafenib cetuximab combo versus chemo. Um, if I were to bet, I would bet chemo would win uh, because while this, this combo is very promising, it's really not a gangbuster. This is no imatinib for GIST. Um, so we've, we've still got some work to do in, in BRAF cancers. Oh, the other thing I want to say before moving on is other BRAF mutations that are not V600E behave incredibly differently and uh, probably wouldn't respond all that well to this treatment. Next slide. Um, so that is sort of our landscape here of what we do for metastatic colorectal cancer with really the only new stuff being how we go after MSI high, still with my typo there in orange, um, or with our BRAF V600E mutated. Next slide. But I do want to focus on this very small subgroup of people who have RAS wild type HER2 positive disease. Next so HER2 alterations are something that we don't typically think about that much in metastatic colorectal cancer, but they are present in about 5 to 7% of people. What we know about this is it confers resistance to EGFR inhibitors. So if you have HER2 alteration and you get cetuximab, it's not going to work. Um, what we also know is that a couple of trials have demonstrated some activity in this setting. And so what that figure there on the right is, is what's called a waterfall plot of a second line trial of lapatinib and trastuzumab for HER2 positive uh, 
colon cancers. And any um, bar there that is going below the dotted line means that the cancer either stopped growing or shrank on chemotherapy, on treatment. Um, and so you can actually see that most of the patients in this small trial had some benefit from lapatinib and trastuzumab, but there is no FDA approved standard. Next slide. So that brings us back to this uh, trastuzumab deruxtecan, and as you guys may be aware, they named all of these trials DESTINY, which I think is very funny. Um, but this is the DESTINY colon trial. Um, this one, unlike the one we saw in stomach cancer, this was not a randomized trial. Rather, it just took anybody um, who had HER2 expressing metastatic colorectal cancer and treated them with trastuzumab deruxtecan. Um, the cohort A are the people with the strong HER2, the people we usually think of being positive with 3 plus IHC or 2 plus um, with FISH positivity like we do in breast cancer. The other have less, um, less robust expression. Next slide. So these results are really very promising in colorectal cancer. What we see is a median progression-free survival of uh, seven months, which is much better than what we would see with the competitor drugs in this space, which are Lonserf and Regorafenib. The median survival there was not reached, not a ton of follow-up time, but as you can see, over half of people were still alive at 12 months, which is very exciting uh, for refractory colorectal cancer. But this really only worked in the people with strong HER2 expression. So the response rate in those with 3 plus was 45%, but in the people with lower HER2 expression, it was only 7%. Next slide. So, um, so to close up with the HER2 positive colon cancer, um, trastuzumab deruxtecan, I would anticipate, will be uh, part of our regular armamentarium now. Um, I think it would be very reasonable if you were unable to find a clinical trial for somebody with HER2 positive colorectal cancer to try and get uh, that drug off label, um, though uh, success in doing that may be fairly uh, variable. So I'm going to finish now by talking about biliary cancers um, because we have a couple of new, new findings here. So this is a really terrible scam, but unfortunately is from a delightful man that I took care of who presented um, with itching and fatigue and was found to have a gigantic intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The molecular profile of his cancer showed um, an IDH1 mutation. Next slide. So I want to take a second to show you this figure uh, published by the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group where they looked at the molecular expression within cholangiocarcinomas because it's really important to note that while we lump them all together as biliary tract cancers, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, so the mass forming type that look just like regular old cancers in the liver, are very different from the extrahepatic ones that truly sort of creep along the bile ducts, either in the liver hilum or outside of the liver. And you can see that in this expression profile where the intrahepatic cancers have about a 20% chance of having a mutation in IDH1 and about a 10 to 15% chance of having an alteration in the FGFR2 gene. Whereas if the extrahepatics just have these horrible mutations we can't do anything about, just like uh, looking very much more like a pancreas cancer. Next slide. So that means that our heat map actually probably depends on where your cancer started. So I probably need a, a new row here. New slide. So back to, to this fellow. So um, when he presented, you know, chemotherapy only was our option. Um, and so he started on triplet therapy with gemcitabine, cisplatin, and abraxane and had excellent control of his cancer. Actually shrank a lot. I should have put in a, a follow-up scan there. And his disease was controlled for about a year, but he stopped because he was having progressive toxicity and had a bad quality of life from all that chemo. Next slide. While this is not molecularly targeted, I did just want to bring this phase two trial uh, upon which his treatment decision was made to your attention. Um, we have our standard gemcitabine cisplatin there on the left, and then there was this phase uh, two trial of gemcitabine cisplatin and abraxane. What we saw was that the triplet therapy looked really very promising with a median survival of 19 months versus the 11 we usually see with gem cis. I don't know if that's because of the abraxane or simply selection bias, but um, in patients, I need a very rapid response and I'm trying to get to possible surgical resection. I do often discuss gemesis abraxane. Next slide. 
But the reason I talked about that first line chemo with you is that um, as of just a few weeks ago, we saw a presentation of this Topaz-1 trial at GI ASCO. And so this took patients just like our fellow we were just discussing with untreated advanced biliary cancer and randomized them to receive either gemcitabine, cisplatin, or placebo, or gemcitabine, cisplatin, and dervalumab, um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, the thing I don't like about this trial and didn't we took part in it and I hated doing this was after eight cycles, patients uh, had their chemo stopped and either got dervalumab or placebo maintenance. Um, but be that as it may, that's what we've got. Next slide. So this trial uh, was positive in that the dervalumab plus chemo group shown in purple did better than the uh, placebo plus chemo group shown in orange. Um, that cutoff really starts um, after uh, the chemotherapy is stopped. That's where you see those survival curves start to separate. Um, but when you follow these along, by the time you get out to 10 months, you see about a 8% improvement in survival, which seems to continue to persist over the next uh, year or so. Next slide. Uh, Dervalumab also slightly improved the response rate from 18.7 to 26.7% um, in terms of who had a reduction in the size of their cancer. So my take on this is that Dervalumab does offer a small incremental benefit over GEMSYS. It was so, you know, about 10% improvement in response and 10% improvement in survival in 18 months. So, you know, there are some patients who are going to benefit, but this is not currently FDA approved. I expect it probably will be. Next slide. So back, though, to these novel mutations I was just mentioning. Next. We have two new drugs uh, to think about in this disease. And the first is pemigatinib, which targets the FGFR fusion, which we just saw is present in about 10 to 15 percent. Um, this was a single arm trial in which patients were treated with pemigatinib, which is an oral agent that you take for two weeks on and one week off. Um, it, this was not subdivided by FGFR fusion. Anybody could participate who had biliary cancers, but the primary endpoint was in that FGFR fusion group where my blue arrow is pointed. And what you can see is the vast majority of people either had response um, or stable disease. Only 15% of people progressed. On, in contrast, the people without any FGFR um, alterations or with a different non-FGFR2 fusion, uh, they didn't really benefit. Next slide. And uh, if you follow this out in terms of how people did over time, what you can see is that the uh, overall survival was about 21 months. Now, take that with a grain of salt because these uh, cancers seem to behave a little better anyway, but it definitely looked um, much better than we typically see. Next slide. So I'm um, starting to run a little low on time, but I just want to be sure to talk with you all about ivacitinib um, and its cousin drug, whose name I currently can't remember, uh, that are both FDA approved for IDH1 mutated cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, ivacitinib was approved first on the basis of this trial, which was just standard um, ivacitinib versus placebo. Next slide. Um, and the moral of the story is for this drug is it works, like kind of, um, it definitely improved progression-free and overall survival, but the overall difference between those was not fantastic. And again, um, this is not a drug that is resulting in clinical complete responses or prolonged disease control other per than perhaps for a couple of patients who have a year or so of cancer control with it. Next slide. Um, just to mention, in case you haven't had a chance to prescribe these drugs yet, um, they have some slightly quirky side effects, pemigatinib in particular, which causes hyperphosphatemia in a high number of people, as well as alopecia. Um, ivacitinib, in my experience, causes quite a bit of nausea. Next slide. Uh, so unfortunately, none of these things worked for, for the man I was taking care of, and he ended up um, passing away pretty quickly after this scan was taken. Next slide. 
So I want to end uh, with just reminding everybody, in case you haven't seen these data, that the KRAS G12C mutation turns out to be really important in GI cancers too. We're all starting to think about this very specific mutation in lung cancers, um, but this trial is one of a couple that were presented at GI ASCO. And in this CRYSTAL trial, this took patients with lots of different diseases, but it honed in on the people who had a solid tumor who were treat, excuse me, with a uh, with a GI tumor who were treated with uh, this adagrasib, which is a KRAS G12C inhibitor. Next slide. And the take home for this is that um, even among people with pancreatic cancer shown on this slide, all of them had a, at least some response to this drug uh, with a median duration of response of seven months. Next slide. And if you look at the summary of pancreatic cancer, which is the first uh, column there, and then all other GI cancers, you can see a disease control rate across all of the GI cancers enrolled in this trial of patients whose cancer have a, a KRAS G12C mutation, all of them um, had their cancer stop growing with this drug. So um, if you find a G12C mutation, uh, please try and find a trial for your patient. And if that's not available, uh, I think uh, getting off-label use of, um, of the approved drug would be what I would try and do. Next slide. So back to my heat map, uh, I added the G12C in there just as a reminder. But overall, I think we're filling this in. I think there are going to end up being um, more mutations that we're going to have to go after um, over time. And probably figuring out some way to combine a bunch of these is, is going to be how we'll really move the needle on these cancers. Next slide. Ah, good. So that was the end. So I will stop there and um, turn it back over to Tim. All right, Dr. Sanoff, thank you so much. This has been great. Um, we do have a, a few minutes for questions. So the, the, at that same, that same place you've been using, Poll Everywhere, to submit the answers to uh, Dr. Sanoff's questions. Now it's your turn. Go ahead and uh, ask her questions. Uh, we'll wait for those to come in. Um, I've got one while, while we're waiting. If, if we were to ask you back in two years, highly likely, uh, what, 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 what would you expect you might be talking about that's new and different from what you're talking about today? Oh, gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no crystal ball? No, I don't have a crystal ball. I mean, the, the, the clear, obvious nut to crack is how come GI cancers don't do well with immunotherapy when so many other cancers do, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're seeing colorectal cancer is a great example. Um, I didn't dive into it, but there are a number of trials using those immunotherapy drugs in the, in the majority of colon cancers that are not MSI high. And whenever you do these trials, you see like one or two patients who benefit, but how come those folks do and the others don't? And so that's really where the field is, is trying to figure out immunotherapy resistance and what we can do to overcome it. So that's my hope. Um, I don't know if we'll be there in two years, but I hope we will. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, we'll hope to have you back with some good news in a couple of years. We do. Uh, I didn't see questions come in yet. We had uh, comments. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, interesting presentation. I'm not familiar with specific applications of immune checkpoint inhibitors. This is a nice introduction to their place in therapy. So thank you for those comments. I'm going to jump ahead and I, I, you have if, out there in the audience, you have two or three more minutes to submit questions. I'm going to jump ahead to our other wrap-up slides, and then I'll come back to our Q&A slide in case uh, somebody wants to take another minute or two to submit a question. I want to thank uh, the people of North Carolina for their very generous support of the University Cancer Re Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. I want to thank Mary King, John Powell, Jason Paler, Veneranda Obore, Oliver Marth, and Andrew Dodgson, our team. Uh, each and every one of them works hard with different areas of the lecture preparation uh, and, and the whole post-lecture process as well. So we really thank our team for, for all of their hard work on this. Anything else that I can tell you here? Uh, we do have a question. Do you think there could be a correlation with the gut microbiome? And I'll go back to that so that that populates here. Uh, absolutely. Um, so 
you know, we're just learning how this works. We definitely, um, the data that exists clearly show that the gut microbiome uh, modifies the likelihood of response to immune checkpoint inhibitors across the board. And there's been a ton of uh, research on, well, not a ton, but there's been a lot of research coming out on this in, in a variety of diseases. Um, and we actually, interestingly, just saw presented in abstract form at GI ASCO. It was only 12 patients, which is why I didn't present it here. But in rectal cancer, people at MSI high cancers had a um, 100% of them had response to um, immune checkpoint inhibitors such that their cancer went completely away, um, which is so much different than we see when it's metastatic, raising the question of if the microbiome is changing things. Um, and that was Andrea Sersek presented that at um, GI ASCO if you want to take a look at that. So absolutely plays a role. But how we fix that, I don't know. I don't know if we'll be, end up giving people fecal transplants to get them to respond to their immunotherapy in the future. Um, it could be. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, we did have one other comment. Terrific presentation. Please keep forging ahead. Um, so thank you for that comment as well. Uh, let's see. Anything else I need to say here? Let's Dr. Sanoff, thank you so much. This has been just great. We uh, really appreciate your time and expertise today. You're welcome. All right. Take care, everyone.